In the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit. Amen. Amen. The weeks after a major election often come with the feeling of a new beginning, a fresh start, a door open to future possibilities. It would not be so easy, I think, not soberly, to say that about the results of this year's strange and exhausting political contest, regardless of which side you're on or not on. Nevertheless, it still seems to me ironic that precisely this election month is the time of the church year when we turn to dwell especially not on beginnings, but on endings. Of course, that also means that Advent and another year of worship together are on the horizon and shockingly close. There'll be more continuity and consistency in that transition than we might at first think. And in a saner world, it might well be that the church season of Advent and the American election season would be exactly reversed in public prominence. But anyway, during this and the next two weeks in November, our Sunday readings will be in accordance with long tradition about the final fulfillment, about the end, prophecies of the day of the Lord and parables of the return of the king. In this time before the changing of the liturgical year, we'll hear not predictions of this or that exact moment, not chronologies or charts of how things will or won't unfold, but images and illustrations and analogies that challenge our categories and that contradict our control. We'll be in a, immersed in a wealth of word pictures, suggesting once again how little we understand by our own lights, what our world is really like and where it's really going. And yet those things, that language, it isn't in the Bible in order merely to confuse us or to amuse us. Jesus' final reflection, the take home with regard to this parable of the bridesmaids in our second reading for today from Matthew chapter 20, 25, the take home is this, keep awake, stay alert, live with your eyes open. Even after 2000 years, even in a time of political and pandemical chaos, Jesus' disciples, it would appear, have their marching orders. Keep awake. The more I think about it, the more it strikes me that Jesus' choice of metaphor here was brilliantly relatable. We all know how hard it is to stay awake when you're tired or when you're grieving or when there isn't anything happening that's worth staying up for. We all know that after a certain point, nothing, no matter how momentous or urgent, seems like it could possibly be more important than getting some rest. We all know how lonely and tranquilizing it can be in the dead of night when everyone around us long ago went to bed. We all know that people trying to keep awake are often described as fighting sleep. It's a struggle, a battle. We all know what it's like to be those drowsy bridesmaids, all 10 of them, oddly, who lost their fight waiting for the bridegroom, both the prepared and the unprepared. The image of staying awake and alert is a vivid and dramatic one. It resonates with us, not only intellectually, but emotionally. And we could leave it at that, leave it at the point of acknowledging Jesus' teacherly brilliance and imaginative artistry, but to leave it at that would be to fail to take Jesus seriously. It would be to fail to hear what Jesus said. Because keep awake is as much an instruction, as much a command from Jesus to his disciples as love the Lord your God with all your heart and with all your soul and with all your mind. As much a command as if anyone strikes you on the right cheek, turn the other also. As much a command as you who would come after me, you must deny yourselves and take up your cross and follow me. Keep awake is intended to be the result, the reality of the parable of the bridesmaids in the lives of Christians. Keep awake is included in the Great Commission. Teach them to obey everything that I have commanded you. And if that's the case, if that's the case, then it makes sense. It makes a difference to ask. Wait, what did Jesus actually mean by keep awake? 
Sure, we all know what it's like and how hard it can be. We know how much energy it can demand at a time when energy is exactly what we don't have to stay awake literally. But it would seem at first reading that Jesus' command, keep awake, never, never escapes from the world of the parable, so to speak. According to Matthew, he doesn't give the key to the illustration. He doesn't explain the metaphor, as he apparently sometimes did in other instances. And then there's a somewhat confusing aspect that in the story, the five foolish and the five wise bridesmaids all failed to stay alert. They all took a nap when they should have been watching for the bridegroom. Now, is that supposed to tell us that whatever keep awake means all human beings, including all Christians, all disciples, are going to find it hard to do? Hard enough so that everyone will at some point come up short, that everyone will at some point disobey the command? That would be kind of depressing, but it wouldn't be particularly surprising. Yet I suspect that there's something else going on, and here's why. This isn't the first time in Matthew that Jesus says, keep awake. We find the same thing, the same command in the previous chapter of Matthew. And we heard it, interestingly enough, at the beginning, at the very beginning of the church year that is now coming to an end. In other words, we heard it on the first Sunday of Advent, December 1, 2019, 50 Sundays ago which probably seems to some of us to be not only already part of ancient history, but part of a different universe, the way our life at church and school and work has gone in 2020. It's actually in the same overall section of the Gospel of Matthew, the same block of Jesus' teaching, we might say, as today's reading. But we last heard it at Prince, as Prince of Peace Church such a long time ago. So it might be good to be reminded. According to Matthew chapter 24, Jesus says about the coming of the Son of Man, about that day and hour, no one knows, neither the angels of heaven nor the Son, but only the Father. For as the days of Noah were, so will be the coming of the Son of Man. For as in those days before the flood, they were eating and drinking, marrying and giving in marriage until the day Noah entered the ark and they knew nothing until the flood came and swept them all away. So too will be the coming of the son of man. Then two will be in the field. One will be taken and one will be left. Two women will be grinding meal together. One will be taken and one will be left. Keep awake, therefore, for you do not know on what day your Lord is coming. Keep awake, therefore. The same words, exactly the same words as in our reading for today. But in that part of Matthew chapter 24 that we last heard way back in 2019, in that part of Matthew, Jesus doesn't say anything about sleeping. His illustrations aren't about the dangers of drowsiness. It's a, it's a different setup. It's a, it's a different set of parables. But he comes to the same conclusion. Keep awake. So, I'm inclined to think that what Jesus means by keep awake has to do with being alert, being prepared, the way the five wise bridesmaids had extra oil for their lamps. And that brings up another question. If all that's so, if then, then how are we supposed to be alert and to be prepared for something about which Jesus seemed to take particular pains to insist, something about which no one, not even the angels, not even the sun, no one except the Father knows when or how, knows the day or the hour it will happen. How are we supposed to be alert and to be prepared, in fact, for something about which we might very well be tempted to distort by our own prejudices and fantasies, the way the people of Israel were accused through Amos in our first reading for today of treating the coming and final day of the Lord. Alas for you who desire the day of the Lord. Why do you want the day of the Lord? I hate, I despise your festivals. I, I take no delight in your solemn assemblies. Even though you offer me your burnt offerings and grain offerings, I will not accept them. Take away from me the noise of your songs. I will not listen to the melody of your harps. Surely, surely the way to be alert and to be prepared for something about which we don't know when or indeed how it will happen the way to be prepared is to live, in a sense, as though it were already here. 
not as if we were victors in a contest at others' expense, but in anticipation and by testimony. When the day of the Lord dawns with finality, when the king returns in glory for all to see, when the truth becomes the very source of our life together, when the good shines permanently like the sun, then, then the worship of God will rise from every place with thanksgiving. Then the peoples will find their unity in doing God's will through love. Then the habits and hobbies and causes into which we've, we've poured time and energy will be given their deep reason and meaning. Then justice will roll down like waters and righteousness like an ever-flowing stream. To, to be alert, to be prepared, to keep our lamps trimmed and burning, to stay awake for that now is to worship God with thanksgiving, being formed by scripture and music and prayer. It's to seek unity in God's will with other Christians and with other human beings. It's to pursue good habits and hobbies and causes with an eye and a word for what makes them part of God's creation, part of God's new creation. It's to serve and to pray for the justice that reflects God's compassionate design for human lives and for the righteousness that lifts up not our own greatness, but God's mercy. And first and last and everywhere in between, it's to name the name of Jesus, visibly and audibly, in speech and in obedience. Because in Jesus and in him alone, we've been given a foretaste and preview of the coming kingdom. In Jesus and him alone, it's been revealed to us what the promised day of the Lord will bring. Let's not kid ourselves. Election or no election, whether right or left ends up on top now or later, whether or not we have any interest in politics whatsoever, bearing faithful witness to Christ the Lord in our time, in our culture, will increasingly be like staying awake when everyone else has gone blissfully to sleep. On a major news website, the day after the election, I read the title of an article. In uncertain times, a Louisville church turns to the gospel. Great, but the time for the church to turn to God's gospel is not when uncertainty and crisis call our abilities into question. The time for the church to turn to the gospel is always. On Beth's Facebook feed this week, someone posted the slogan, now it's in God's hands. Great. But the time to recognize that God is sovereign is not after our efforts, apart from God, have finally come to nothing. The time to recognize and to serve God's rule is always. In Jesus, we've been given the mercy of knowing the God who sees our sins, all of them, and forgives us. That's the reason we may awake and follow him. Amen.